How's everyone doing today? So good to see everybody. Hey, it was so good to have uh, Brian Cosmos and his new wife, the first time wife, <laughs> is Alexis. And he's got married. Brian grew up in this church and, uh, and actually went to Kairos Bible College. And so it's such an honor. He works there now as a worship leader. So it's so great to have him come for this weekend just to join with us. And uh, so it's a, what a wonderful opportunity. I love seeing people grow up and then serving God in a wonderful way, and so it's an honor to have him here today with his wife. Hey, we are in a series called The Sermon on the Mount, and we're actually finishing The Sermon on the Mount today. Sermon on the Mount was a teachings that Jesus gave in the book of Matthew from chapter 5 to chapter 7. It's the longest discourse we have with Jesus in the Bible at one time, and he starts off, the whole teaching is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of God. And he goes through that. And it's a wonderful place we began because when you recognize that you're poor in spirit, that you have nothing that you can give on your own and that no matter how hard you try, it's not enough. It's a good place to begin because in Christ and through Christ and by Christ, all of us can. But when you come to that point, it's a wonderful blessing. And so we talked about that. And so today we're gonna be um, finishing out the Sermon on the Mount. Let me just move this over a little bit. And then we're gonna be going... Uh, starting a new series in a couple of weeks called Design Sexuality. We're going to look at what God says about sexuality, and this is going to be about a life-giving series that's going to be coming. But next week, we have our dear friend David Wagner coming. Uh, we're so excited to have him come. And then, then Pastor Ranker, the following week, the founding pastor. We're kind of celebrating a little bit the 40th anniversary of Cornerstone. And we're also going to give you an opportunity. We're going to look to plant four churches and unreached people groups as well as we celebrate our 40th year. We decided to forego all the big pomp and circumstance. We'd rather put our money and help other churches begin. So that's what we're going to be doing instead. So we're going to have a good time still, but that's what's going to be happening. So today we are finishing off with our series today. And I, I, I used to go to New York City. I still go once in a while in the 80s. And uh, I, I saw my friend of mine in school had a Rolex. I said, wow. You know, I grew up in the 80s, okay? In the 80s, everything was excessive, big, bad, right? And so I remember my friend had a Rolex. I said, wow, where'd you get that from? Well, I got it in New York City. And I thought it was fake. So I went to New York City, and I went, and one of these guys come in the corner. They come with a suitcase. They open it up. <laughs> they look around. with look, look like no cops. Today, they don't care about that anymore. But back in those days, they actually had police officers that cared because they used to enforce the law. But I have no opinion about that. So anyhow... <laughs> So they open it up, <laughs> and, and, and I saw, and the guy starts to, $100. And I talked him down to $15, and I got myself a fake Rolex watch. <laughs> now, I don't wear that today because you'd think I'm one of those guys that, you know, take advantage of people. But, you know, I have a friend of mine, actually, that has a $25,000 Rolex watch. Don't judge him, okay? He gave it to me. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> So you have a Rolex watch, and how can you tell the difference between the two of them? You can't look at at, at first glance, but you can tell because the Rolex watch does not, it's not, oh, tick, tick, tick. It actually is a real smooth action, and it has jewels inside. You have to, and, and it's a different type of watch, but at first glance, you cannot tell. It looks fake. A number of years ago, I went to a Christmas party with someone in our church, and when I got there, I saw a Ferrari. And I like Ferrari, I like cars, right? And I used to watch something called Magnum P.I. How many know what I'm talking about? Okay, I'm dating myself once again. And I used to love, I, I, all the girls watched for Tom Selleck, I watched for the car. So I liked this 308, and I, walk, I drove to this, this Christmas party, and I saw a 308 Ferrari. I'm like, wow, who's got the Ferrari? And I, I went up close, wait a minute, it looked kind of funny. And I found out it was a fake Ferrari. It was a Pontiac Fiero <laughs> with a body kit on it. It's bad, and so they even have an MR2 for, uh, Toyota, and it's not a real Ferrari, and it looks like it, and, and, and you think it's the same one. It's still, it, it can still take you to point A to point B, but it's fake. There are people today that are fake believers. They say they're believers, and they're not. They fool themselves. 
There are genuine believers and fake believers. And the truth of the matter is, Jesus will one day judge it, and we're not going to be able to tell until the end of the age. But there are some ways we can tell. And today, I want us to look at that today and what that means today. So what we're going to do, first of all, is read the scriptures. Right, We're going to finish off the chapter of chapter 7. We're going to read the entire passage And then we're going to break it down pretty much line by line by verse by verse. Listen, everybody, I love the Bible. I have a lot of things I could say, but I much rather have the Bible do the talking and us to kind of reveal and and, and, uncover what it says and not just give opinions. And so today is a lot of scripture, but it's really important that we know the scriptures because Jesus says, I am the word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we believe the words of God. We believe the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible, are inspired by God. They don't just contain the word of God. They are the word of God. We believe that. That our standard comes from there. And if you ever want to wonder, well, how do you know the Bible is true? We did a series called It Is Written. where We talked about how you can trust the Bible. But for today, let's go ahead and read it. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. Here we go. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide And the the, the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Beware of the false prophets who, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. I just want to stop here for a moment. We spoke a couple of weeks ago we says, judge, but don't be judgmental. And so this is, we, we need to inspect what we see, but we're not judgmental. We don't have the final authority. But thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did, did we not prophesy in your name and, and cast out demons, not dems, demons, I don't know how that got in there. There's, some, there's a mole around here. Someone's pointing stuff like that. It should say rubs. Republicans too. Okay, all right. Cast out demons. How did that happen? There is somebody around here that's causing trouble. Okay. Cast out demons in your name and do many works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded On the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and bared against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. So Jesus ends his teaching, and then the summary statement is this. And when Jesus has finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For He was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. He was speaking the truth in love and power. You see, it's you can speak the truth and you can have love and truth simultaneously. That's God. What the enemy does is he takes information and he uses it to accuse, to confuse, and to condemn. Christ has come to convict to give people a choice. So there are only... Two roads in life. There was a time, I'm not quite sure it's still the case, but a number of years ago, if you went to the United Nations in New York City, they had the chapel area. And they end the chapel area, to enter the chapel area, they have all these doors. And each, on top of each door, it says Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism. It has all these different isms. 
and you open the door and you find out you're in the same chapel. That's the perverting worldview. It's your truth. It's whatever is true for you is fine. But Jesus does not give us that exclusivity to say whatever I want. He says this, I am the way. There's only one way. So there's only two roads, either on the right road or the wrong road. Well, how do you know what road you're on? Well, here's some ways you can tell. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate. And the Greek word there for narrow is difficult or constricting. The narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. I hear it all the time. People say, well, everyone else is doing it. Everyone else is watching this movie. Every other pastor is doing this, so why can't I? And I've seen it happen slowly but surely. You just start to go a little like this, a little like this. You go a little off the mark for a period of time. The next thing you know, you're way off the mark. And I've seen this happen in my own life where I've allowed a little compromise. And what am I doing? And I find out I'm going the wrong direction. And it can happen to you as well. It says, enter by the narrow gate. It's constricting, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. Chances are, if everyone's doing it, it's probably wrong. I never forget one time I was going to see a concert and everyone was going, trying to go through these two doors. I'm like, why is everyone, it's this big, big line of people. So I walked over to another door, opened it up, went right in. And then people started following me. Because people like to follow the crowd. Because the crowd must be right. I have found that the crowd usually is wrong. And so enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy. It's easy, right? That leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. Many people follow that road, everybody. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. What is all this narrow-mindedness? What is... I, I, that's a problem with Christianity. You guys are so narrow-minded. All true. It doesn't make a difference what you believe as long as you're sincere, right? You've heard that? And the problem with people, the problem with the church of Jesus Christ is that we believe in absolute truth. But I read a survey just recently in the last week. There was a survey done in the last six months with over 1,000 pastors in the United States of America. And these pastors they interviewed were not the mainline churches. These were quote-unquote evangelicals. I don't like the word evangelical because people think it's a voting block. But evangelical simply means they believe in the Bible and Jesus. Well, out of the 1,000 they asked pastors, 30% said they believe that not... Jesus is not the only way, but a way. The evangelical church. Well, God understands where you're at, and it's, what, and it's your heart. He looks at your heart, and this is what's going on. We see a people leaving the, the word of God and saying, well, that was back then, and you make all these excuses up, and they kind of parse out the scripture verses. And if they had to go through all these acrobatics to make the Bible say something, probably it's false. The Bible is clear and true. It's not a secret knowledge. Christ is flat out honest, true, all right? And so what happens? An easy way that leads to destruction. For the gate is narrow and few find it. I don't like this whole thing. That's the problem. You, you, you need to be more tolerable of me. I hear it all the time. You have to have toleration for people. Have you noticed those that scream the loudest for toleration are fine until you disagree with them? Then you become the problem, Right? Because, yeah, yeah, and so the truth of the matter is there are absolutes. They say there are no absolutes. And the fact anyone would say there's no absolutes, that's an absolute within itself. So you can't get away from absolutes. You know why? Because there's absolutes. If there was no such thing as absolutes, you couldn't get away from absolutes. But you can't get away from absolutes. Imagine a world without absolutes. Imagine you're on an airplane, and you're coming in for a landing. You know, you're looking at your watch, and you're, you're, you're gonna start, you start texting. You're not supposed to post about it. I, what is the deal with that? Why can't you have your phone on when they're flying an airplane? Are you telling me that $80 million airplane is going to go down because you're on your iPhone? Okay, that's just a little pet peeve of mine. Anyhow, so you're sitting there texting. I'll, I'm landing in a few moments. Imagine you hear this. Attention, this is your captain speaking. We're so glad you're flying with us at Trust Airlines. We'll be... We've got a clear for runway four, but I'm feeling a bit frisky today. I'm going to go to runway seven, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> what would you do, right? Well, they said runway four, and this is, this is Kennedy Airport, one of the busiest airports in America. What are you talking about, you feel frisky today? Or imagine this. Imagine you go to the pharmacist, and the pharmacist goes, oh, 
I got, the, I got, the, I got your script from your doctor, you know. He's kind of narrow-minded. So what I did, I, I, you, know, you have 30 pills in there. I threw about seven blue ones that are a little polka dot, and just, just to kind of see what's going to happen. Just, I think you'll like it better. What would you do with that? Or how about this? You go to our doctor for an appendectomy. You know, your, your appendix is about ready to burst. You're in pain, and you get out of it, and the doctor goes, oh, we had a great success. Oh, thank God. He said, there was a lot there when, 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 you, when I opened you up. And so I took it upon myself to take out your, your kidney. And there was a lady in the next uh, operating room that needed one. So I just thought it would be kind of nice to do that. How would you feel about that? So there are absolutes, everybody. There's truth and there's false. Mathematics is a real stubborn thing. I don't know if you've noticed it. But 2 plus 2 always equals 4. It did not equal 6. And so there are laws in the universe that you cannot break. You break the laws, they break you. And now people are saying, no, no, we create our own God. We create our own laws. We, I have my truth. Is it not true for everybody? It's not truth. Either Jesus is a son of God or he's not. Either the Bible's true or it's not. There's only two roads. But all the roads we did have, and Jesus never said that. Jesus never said that. In fact, this is what Jesus says, really kind of arrogant of him. He says in John chapter 10, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Remember we said that enter the what? Enter the narrow gate? Well, Jesus says, I am the gate. And whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief, who's the enemy, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they would be bored and suck on lemons. Is that what it says? No. What does it say? I have come that they would have what? Life. Zoe. Life. Epiphesence. Everything you and I dream of. And have it to the fullest. Christ has come to give us a full life. The problem is the enemy has a false Rolex, a fake Rolex, a fake Ferrari saying, hey, you can do it through this. It's not the same thing. It may look like it. it may, people might think it's the right thing, but it's false. God is the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. And you see, he wants you to have life. He's made you in his image. And if you violate his rules, you hurt yourself. Not that he's an angry God. But if you, if you don't do what it says, you get yourself into trouble. In fact, I'm going to pick on him a little bit. Brian, who led worship today, a number of years ago, many, 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 many moons ago, tried to help his mother up. They had a Honda CRV, and he decided to put diesel fuel. <laughs> I don't think Brian's here. <laughs> he probably won't do the worship the next service. But he put diesel fuel in a gas engine that cost them thousands of dollars to correct. Well, who are you to tell me that? I'm going to do what I want to do. He meant well, by the way. Okay, let's move on. Jesus is absolutely the only way. Amen. He is. He's the only way. If it's truth, it's only... Jesus didn't die on the cross for another philosophy. I like what C.S. Lewis says. I am, I'm paraphrasing. He says there's only three options. You cannot say that Jesus is a wonderful moral teacher because no wonderful moral teacher would say that he's God if he's not. So Jesus is either a lunatic, out of his mind, should be committed to a mental asylum, or he is a liar, a great deceiver. But how could a great deceiver say, love your neighbor as yourself, and write the incredible and say the incredible teachings of Christ? Or he is Lord. He's either lunatic, liar, or Lord. One thing he cannot be is a great moral teacher. You see, the reason they put Jesus on the cross is not because he was a great moral teacher or even a lie. They put him on the cross because he said, I am God. Clearly, he said, I am God. And so Jesus claims to be God, and he rose again from the dead. And again, we don't have time for that today to go into all the proofs of that, which is a many. But Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the only way, he says. I am the only way. So Jesus is, is in the only way. And so we do have absolutes. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He doesn't say, I am a way. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yeah, but, but what about those people that live on a forest that never hear the name of Jesus? What about those Muslims that are bowing down to Mecca and they love God? 
What's going to, if God's going to send them to hell, I don't want to worship an angry, vindictive, Victorian God like that. Or first of all, Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth and I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. I don't have the capacity or the ability to say heaven, hell, heaven, hell. I'm not picking out sports teams for recess. Jesus is the only judge. And the word of God says everyone's going to have to come through me. The only assurance of salvation is through Jesus Christ. If it didn't matter, so what he would say, hey, guys, we had a good time here today. I'm going to heaven, but doesn't, don't, don't worry about it. As long as people are sincere, they'll go to heaven. So you go ahead and relax and enjoy yourself. Don't worry about those Romans. Just have your own kumbaya moment. Have your own church and just relax and enjoy each other. Enjoy the fellowship and have some hamburger meat while you're at it. And just enjoy yourself. That's not what he said. He said, go into all the earth and preach the gospel to all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. He says, go. Why? Because it matters. If it didn't matter, he wouldn't say go. So there is truth. But we do ourselves a disservice when you and I are arbitrators and we are judges and we declaim who's heaven and hell. I don't know. I'm just a messenger. God is going to work that out. But if it did not matter, how can they hear unless someone is sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And we can see what's happening to a culture that says, I don't want God in my schools. I don't want God in my culture. I don't want God in the cities. And what do we see? We see people shooting people up. I heard this past week, someone just shot someone up in Memphis. No, ah, another shooting. Just some guy got out and started shooting people. And we don't even know the difference between what's right and wrong anymore. And you ask yourself the question, why is the crime rate so high? Why is there so much anxiety in our culture? When you violate and you don't listen to God, you hurt yourself. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life, everybody. And that's what he says, no one except for me. So when someone asks me that question, he says, I don't make that determination, but I do know this. Jesus is the only way. The only assurance of salvation is through Jesus Christ. Are you ready to meet Jesus? And that's our job. He works out the details. You see, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but ends in death. I don't care how sincere you are. If you're on the top of a mountain and you jump off without a parachute or one of those squirrel suits, <laughs> you're not going to make it, okay? You, you make known to me the path of life, it says in Psalms. Your presence, there is bitterness and religion. And there's no pleasures. What does it say? But you may know me the path of life. God gives us life. In your presence, there is fullness of what? Joy. That's why um, Stephen, the first martyr of the church, he's saying that Christ is the only way. And they're throwing rocks at him. And he's rejoicing. And he's giving glory to God. Why? You see, you, as the apostle Paul has said, has been read 2 Corinthians this past week, as we read through the Bible in a year, he says, I, I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten three times with rods, this and the other, but I thank God. And he said, though, though I'm troubled, I worship God. Though struck down, but not destroyed. You see, I have a hope beyond what I'm experiencing right now. And he even says later on, I don't compare any of the sufferings of this age and anything in comparison to what lies before us. The apostle Paul says, yeah, I was caught up in a different place and I saw things that no one else knew about. And let me tell you, he says, the glory of God is amazing. Basically, he's saying that. That, listen, everybody, no matter how bad it is right now, it is a blink of an eye compared to eternity. And so, yes, it's difficult right now. There's a chemical reaction going on right now where sin and righteousness are, are kind of effervescent. But you know what's going to happen? It's all going to be settled. and There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And right now is the time for choosing. You make known the path of life in your presence, and there's fullness of joy at your right hand. And pleasures forevermore. You see, God's pleasure is the best pleasure. God's pleasure gives glory to God and gives glory to each other. Our pleasure is about what I can get out of for myself. Our pleasure is about me, me, me. And the, the worst, worst thing and the most horrible thing you can do is live for yourself. You will eat yourself alive. It's like, a, it's like a cancer that will eat you. The more you try to please yourself, the less you'll please yourself. I heard of a story a number of years ago from uh, people. I, I, know, I don't know what you call them. They used to call them Eskimos, but we don't call them that anymore. Um, anyhow, in the northern part of, of Alaska and all that, and how they kill polar bears. So what they will do is they'll get a, a big spike and they'll sharpen it, and they'll put herring and fish on there. So at night, the polar bear will come and smell it and begin to lick it. And as the polar bear licks it, the, the spike, it begins to cut his tongue. 
As it cuts its tongue, the warm blood melts the ice and more of the herring comes out and more of the taste of the fish. And he licks it more and more and more and more. And the following morning, they find him dead because he bled himself to death, licking a false food. That's what the enemy wants to do to us. Promises us more with less satisfaction. But initially, it's wonderful. That's what sin is. It will drive you to a grave. It will drive you to separation from God. You make known into the path of life your presence. There is fullness of joy and the right hand is pleasures forevermore. God wants to give us pleasure. It's okay to want pleasure and joy. We've been created for that. But the problem is we're looking at a false, a fake Ferrari. That's what's happening here. Jesus is absolutely the only way. Beware of false ways, teachers. What's the story with that? Well, This is what Jesus says in that passage of Scripture today. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. It looks like the real thing. Isn't that a Rolex? But inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their what? Fruits, their life. What comes out of their lives? Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And this is what Jesus says. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they'll lead many astray. So there are people that are going to say, I am Jesus. He goes on to say in Matthew 24 again, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. He goes on and says the third time in Matthew 24, for false Christs and false prophets will arise, perform great signs and wonders. They, they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. They'll give you a prophetic word. They'll know what happened to you in the third grade. Oh, that must be God. Be careful. So as to lead astray if possible, even the elect, the greatest lie has the greatest amount of truth but it's a little off. That's why I tell you what I preach, test it to Scripture. Make sure what I'm saying is correct. Don't believe it because I say it. Don't believe it because a great preacher says something. Who cares? Test it. Test it. Look at the Word of God. Is what I'm, I could fall away too. You need to check, check me out, not to try to destroy me, but we should help each other know the truth. See, Jesus says you'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? If someone says, I'm an apple and I have an an orange in my hand, I don't care what you say. The fruit will tell you who you really are. And so this is what begins to happen in our lives. You see, fruit of doctrine. One way is called legalism. That's a false religion as well. It can become that way. Well, you add to. You start adding stuff to the, the Word of God says. God never said these things, but you add things to them. Well, and that's legalism. Or liberalism would be the opposite, subtracting things from the Scripture. Well, we don't want to talk about that. Jesus wants you happy. I've come to give you life and love ever more, and, and every sermon I talk about is how you can have a better life, and it's all good stuff. But I never talk about hell, never talk about how you're going to give an answer for your life. Guess what I'm doing? I'm preaching a false gospel. Now, I don't know what those other folks are doing because I don't know their life. I don't know what I, I see what's on the air. Who knows if that's just an attraction method like Jesus did speaking to the crowds. I don't know. But you know what? If you're not preaching the full gospel, you're not preaching the gospel. You're just not. I mean, the gospel has good, it's good news, but the reason it's good news is because there's bad news. And, and so are, are, we, are we subtracting things out? Well, we don't want to talk about that because it might offend people. So legalism and liberalism So we have false teachers. We have the fruit of their doctrine and the fruit of their life. What's their life like? What's my life like? The Bible says, the Apostle Paul says this, follow me like I follow Christ. The moment I'm not following Christ, please don't follow me at all. Right? I'm just trying to, I'm just a tour guide trying to help you to find God. I'm not a perfect person, but at the moment I'm not leading you to God, then I'm a false prophet. You see, the fruit of the doctrine, the fruit of life. And Jeremiah 6, 13 says this, From the least to the greatest, their lives are ruled by greed. This can happen in a church. All of a sudden, well, we got some money now. Oh, okay. I'm going to buy this, buy that. and Wow, if I say that offering that way, I'd get more of an offering. And the next thing you know, I start just compromising, 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 compromising. Five years goes by, ten years goes by, and then all of a sudden, I'm way off. It could happen to me. I'm using me as an example. That's why I have accountability. That's why we have the Assemblies of God over me. That's why I have a district presbyter. That's why I have Nick Furtado who's over me. That's why we have deacons. We have people that keep me accountable. I'm not, I, it's not just me and my wife and the board. Why? Because I'm recognizing the fact that without Christ, I could fall. We have to be accountable. Why do we have small groups for? Because you and I can be led astray. 
I, I never forget Indiana Jones, uh, and I'm, I'm dating myself once again, but he's, he's sitting there, he's going through, and the guy goes like this. He's like, what? There's a spider on you. It takes a spider off of him. We need to look out for each other. This is why we have small groups, to help us to grow strong in Christ. You're not called to do it by yourself. We're called to be a body. So we're ruled by greed. They offer superficial treatments for my people's moral wound. Oh, God wants you happy. No, you're full of sin. You're going to hell. Now, hell might not be what people say it is, but hell is separation from God. They give assurances of peace when there's no peace. There's some more I could say about that. So we have the fruit of doctrine can check out, the fruit of their life. How about the fruit of their followers? What are the followers like? Now, granted, we make mistakes here at Cornerstone Church. I make mistakes. But this is the difference. When I make a mistake and I do something wrong, there's something inside me that says, get it right. You know when you feel that? You, you do something wrong, you said something, you said a joke that was kind of, it was knocking someone else down to get a joke, and you're like, man, I shouldn't have done that. Well, when that happens, you need to apologize to God and apologize to that person. But if I do that again the next day and I forget about it, I get blinded to that area. Then I start to drift away. I'm not saying I'm going to go to hell, but I begin to lose my effectiveness. And so do you. You see, our fruit of our doctrine, fruit of our life, and fruit of the followers, where, <clears throat> but wisdom is shown to be right by the lives of those who follow it. What does your life look like? That's what the Bible says. Not many of you should be teachers because more will be asked of you. I don't like that scripture verse at all. It gives you standards for what it means for biblical leadership. We, we got to work hard. Now, do we work hard without God? No, but there are standards that God asks us to do. And second, second Peter 2 says this, but false prophets also rose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, anyone says, I have a secret. Send 1999 for the first chapter and every week. Send me $300 and I'll give you a prophecy. Look out for people like that. Anytime there's secret knowledge, it's probably a cult. Because God speaks right out in the open. And that's what he does through the Bible. There will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive <clears throat> heresies, even denying the master who brought them. Ah, Jesus is not the only way. He's the way. Bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So we have Jesus, the absolutely the only way. Beware of the false ways, teachers, and false confessions. This is the part that makes me a little worried. What does that mean? Many of us can say that we're believers, but we're not. Now, hang on. I want you to listen to what Jesus has to say. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. And by the way, the reason it says Lord, Lord in the Greek language, when it says Lord, Lord, it means like he goes, Martha, Martha, verily, verily. It's like, hey, listen, I'm reading, I mean this true. So when we say Lord, Lord, the connotation is he's my Lord. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I have emotions involved in this thing. I shed a tear during the worship song today. I went out and lived like I wanted to live, and I do what I want to do, and when I'm in trouble, I call on God, but the rest of the time, it's just about me. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who what? Does the will of my Father. That's legalism. Jesus came to get rid of legalism. That's true, but if you love God, there should be a change in your life. There should be something that draws you to him. We'll, we'll get to it in a few moments. I know you're thinking, oh, great, forget it. Hang on. But the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven... On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? I gave a prophecy to somebody and, and cast out demons. Got it right this time. In your name and, and do many mighty works in your name. I, he's a great preacher. I, I learned so much. I, 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 I've gotten free. He, he prayed for me. And it's wonderful. I love this pastor. I think they're, he, him or she is amazing. They're, who cares? What's the lifestyle like? You see, just because someone says the right thing, the Bible says in the book of James, the devil believes even more than, he says, I believe. So the devil believes more than you and I do. And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, Jesus says something very, very chilling and very sobering. And I know I might get, you. first thing, let me say it flat out. If you're in Christ's hand, you are eternally secure. Let me say that. If you're in Christ, you're secure. But this is what the Bible says. Those who endure to the end will be saved. So who are the ones that are really saved? The ones that endure to the end. I can't tell, you can't tell, but God can tell. 
That's what I'm saying. So here at church, it's not just saying I gave my life to Christ. That's great, but that's enough for us. But you have to remain those who endure to the end, continue to follow Christ to the end. That's legalism. No, it's not. I'm putting my faith and trust in Christ. And if I make it to the end, I'm the one that will never lose my salvation because I got to the end. Okay. Now, before you get all theological on me, I'm just saying what the Word of God says. Thank you so much. We'll talk later. Okay. And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, those who practice lawlessness. So, Jesus is the absolute, the only way. Beware of false teachers, false confessions, and how to stand, how to stand saved and strong. Well, Jesus tells us as we finish out this segment of Scripture. Everyone, look at your neighbor and say, you're an everyone. And say, I'm someone. Okay. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and is able to repeat what I said, is that what it says? That's Western Greek education. Often, if, if I have a lot of, you can get a lot of degrees. And just because you can write an essay and say what the professor said or put multiple choice to write one doesn't mean you really know it. It means you know information. But truth is information actualized. In fact, in the time of Christ, you had apprentices. And even in America, we had this happening. Way back, you had an apprentice, and you're a blacksmith, and so you teach somebody else, and they become a blacksmith. And how do you know they're a blacksmith? When they can make a, a shoe, when they make a horseshoe, and they can do it on their own, okay, you're a blacksmith. But in America, we celebrate information, not transformation. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and it beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. The, word, the cornerstone, the name cornerstone actually means rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. It both looks the same. But what happens? This is what happens. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and bared against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. You see, he who hears my words and what? Does them. That's the answer, everybody. There is a lighthouse in, in South Carolina and it is called, and North Carolina actually, the lighthouse in Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. It was the tallest lighthouse built in 1869, 183 feet um, tall, but over 100 years. You know what happened? Erosion began to happen. The waves came, the winds came, and it got to a point where the sea was so close to it, and they, were, they could see that it was starting to falter. The foundation was getting compromised, and this tower, this lighthouse was going to fall. So you know what they did? They put these tracks together. They literally lifted this up, and they moved the lighthouse they moved the lighthouse 2,900 feet away from the shore to a secure location. And that's what they did. And this is the old location, the new location, because it was going to fall. My friends, what happened to you and I? You know, if you're not careful, you can veer away. You have to stay on the rock. Sometimes we say, I'm staying right here, and I'm not going to move. We're in a location. But God's not a location. He is a relationship. Religion makes location sacred. Christ makes relationships sacred. So we stand right here, and God is moving, and we're standing still, and we're building upon an experience instead of a relationship. We have to, what does it mean? You hear the word of God, and you do what it says. And that's how we build our life on the rock. That's how you know you love God. Don't say you love me if you don't listen to what I have to say. If you really love me, imagine if someone says to me, someone slaps my face, I go, Psh. oh, I'm so sorry, Pastor. I didn't mean to do that. I won't do that again. Oh, thanks. Psh. It happens again. Hey, what's going on here? What are you doing? Oh, I'm so sorry. I won't do that again. Okay, great. What happened the third time? Well, what does that apology mean? Nothing. Please don't do that to me. I'd appreciate that. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You know, you hear this and you're like, how are we supposed to do this? This is impossible. I've tried so many times to get rid of this bad habit. I, I constantly have a bad attitude. I constantly fall into the same sin over and over again. And frankly, I'm sick of it. I'm tired of being a hypocrite. I want to be authentic to who I am. I've been living. I have these propensities. I have these desires. And I can't fulfill them. And I try and I fall. I fail. And what's the use? I, I'm a hypocrite. Why even try anymore? You know what? Forget the church. I'm going to live my own way. And you know what? If I go to hell, I go to hell. I don't care anymore. So everyone else is doing 
fine. So what difference does it make? It's just too hard to live the life. I can't do it. And you know what that is? That's a spirit of religion, and that's, a, that's the Antichrist. That's the devil speaking to you and telling you there's no use. But Jesus does not do that. Jesus says the following, I know you can't do it, but I can do it through you and by you and for you. He's not asking you to live for him. Please, I'm going to tell you, one of the foundational doctrines of Cornerstone Church of this place is this. We don't want you living for God. Please, do not live for God. Do not live for Jesus. Do not live for the Holy Spirit. It's a mistake. Don't do it. What? Don't live for Jesus. Don't live for God. Don't live for Jesus. It doesn't work. Instead, live with Jesus, with the power of the Holy Spirit, with the love of the Father. It's all about relationship through Christ not by yourself. You see, what the enemy wants to do is separate you from God and have you do all the works of God. It doesn't work. Jesus said, be connected to me, abide in me, and I in you will bear much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. Religion says, I don't need it. I got the rules. So, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Not like, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Or, hey, if you love me, you're going to want to keep my commandments. You see, the greatest protection for my marriage is I develop a good relationship with Sandra. I love her. I love her more and more every year. And the more temptations come my way, as more I am, I, those things that used to grab me don't grab me anymore. Why? Because I love my wife. I have a relationship with her. You see, and that's when you love God, you're going to want to do his things. You're going to trust God. God has my best in mind. I don't care what the world says. I'm going to do the right thing. Let heaven and earth pass away, but I will stand on his word. That's not legalism. That's relationship. So Christ wants you to live with him, not for him. So let me ask you a question today. Are you a fake believer? Are you a fake follower of Christ, or are you a real follower of Christ? If you feel like, forget it, it's too late, I've done too much, that's not God, that's the enemy. Jesus would say to me, come unto me. Come, I love you. Come unto me, all who are weary, laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you. It doesn't say take your yoke, take my yoke. Christ wants to work with you. He doesn't want you working for him. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. My question to you today, how are you with Jesus? Have you given your life to Christ? Are you staying in Christ? You see, Jesus will have no other. It's not Jesus and, it's Jesus only. Have you given your life completely to Jesus? Or is there something in your life saying, you know what, I love Jesus, but I'm not gonna stop this. If you say in your heart, I love Jesus, but I won't stop doing this, I question if you're really saved. Now, if you say, I love Jesus, and I struggle with an addiction, that's different. But if you've given in to your, I don't care anymore, I do it my way, then I question where you're at. You see, what Jesus asked for is something very simple. That you believe in him, yes, but you surrender your life to him. This is the good news. Jesus is not looking for perfect people. He's looking for surrendered people. And if you're surrendered, no matter how much of a wreck you are, that's enough for Christ. Because he loves you, he desires to see you grow, and he desires you to move forward. I'm telling you right now, Jesus is the way, he's the truth, he's a life. No one comes but by him, but he requires everything from you, or it doesn't work. My question, have you given everything to Jesus?